and uh, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, just out of uh, curiosity, how many of you live in Clifton Knowles? Ah, one person, a couple people. Okay, we're going to talk a lot about Clifton Knowles tonight and some of the other developments. Now, do I have a mic? Yes. yes. Yep. I heard some, Sorry, saw something here. going like that. Great. Oh, there you go. Is this better? Yes. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, before I, I go on topic, I just want to indicate, if anybody's interested, I am doing a canal walk on Saturday uh, down at the Old Erie Canal and the Nature Preserve, and we're going to start at 10 o'clock down at the Whipple Bridge, so if you're interested in doing that, slogging around in the mud, uh, <laughs> it might be an interesting day. Yes? And how long will that walk be? It's two hours. Okay, thank you. We should be done by noon. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Clifton, Clifton Park. Uh, I remember Clifton Park uh, when I was growing up in the 50s, and uh, we lived in Albany, but we rented a camp on Saratoga Lake, and uh, we used to go up there in, uh, in July every year. we come up Route 9, it was before the North Way, and you couldn't tell when you were in Clifton Park or when you left Clifton Park. There was nothing to it but a bunch of farms. Uh, there was the Clifton Park Hotel. That was about the only, only thing. A little uh, hamlet there, at Clifton Park Center. But that, that was it. There's virtually not much of anything here. <clears throat> and Clifton Park, for most of its uh, uh, history, was a farming community. Uh, this is a picture of a farm that was on the corner of uh, Route 146 and Tanner Road, and. Uh, the building was there for a long time, until uh, about early 80s, I guess it was. Uh, some of you may remember it. Uh, uh, it was dismantled and moved. You can now see this Clifton Park building in Charlton on Scotch, Scotch Bush, is there Scotch Bush, Scotch Bush Road? Yeah. So, uh, but this is what much of Clifton Park looked like uh, throughout the 19th century. Fisher Ferry was also a farming area. Uh, we had a peach orchard down there. Uh, the picture on the, on the right is at the John Clark Farm, which is on Fisher Ferry Road. It's uh, just below the town hall on Fisher Ferry Road. Uh, the old farmhouse is still there. Um, in fact, it's on our town's historic register, but you can't see it because there's a big Spanish mansion sort of built in front of it. It's at the, the old house it's, sits way back. And then here they are bringing in the hay. So we had lots of barns, and uh, we're not seeing too many of these uh, barns anymore, but they're disappearing because people have no use for them and they don't want to maintain them. Uh, the barn down on the lower right is right at the corner of uh, uh, Bishop Ferry Road and Crescent Road. Uh, and the building is still there, but the silo is gone. And, and I think those sheds are, are all gone now. That's a very early house there. It was built in 1814. Uh, and then we have this large barn, which is on Grooms Road, and a lot of us know about that barn. Uh, uh, I, had, I was doing a monthly article for the Community News, and one of the readers uh, uh, emailed me and said, hey, this was in the, about year 2000 or 1999. They said, you, you know, this barn's going to be celebrating its uh, centennial soon. You ought to do an article on that. So I did do an article on it. And uh, then it got embroiled in controversy. And uh, as we all know, it, uh, it disappeared mysteriously early one morning and it became a cause celebre for historic preservation in Clifton Park. In those days, when we were primarily a farming community, the grange uh, was very important. Uh, and our, our grange was uh, started uh, in the 1920s, I think in 1924. And uh, this was the grange hall. It's on Sugar Hill Road, just south of Grooms Road. And this is where all of the social activities centered. Uh, this is the uh, picture on the right is the uh, junior grange. Um, and. Uh, their teacher there and learning uh, uh, type of things that you need to know to, to run a farm or to support a farm. And they had dances, and the big thing that they had here 
at the Grange Hall was the Oyster Suppers. Does anybody remember the Oyster Suppers? Well, that was a big deal. Someone would contribute the milk and uh, they'd make these oyster suppers and everybody would, would come to them. And they had those right up until the early 1960s. So with the disappearing farms, uh, the Grange sort of dwindled. And uh, I guess it was uh, around the year 2000, 2004, I think it was, uh, the only members of the Grange were all in their late 80s and early 90s. And uh, so they sort of disbanded the local Grange and they donated the building to the town. So the town now owns the, uh, the Grange Hall. It's just down the road from the Groom's Tavern. So we're going to have a little heritage square area. Uh, <clears throat> and the other major industry in town throughout the 19th and 20th century, again, right up into the 1960s, was the mining of molding sand. Uh, Clifton Park is uh, built on sand, and the sand is great for making molds for cast iron. So that cast iron was, uh, or not cast iron, but the, the molding sand was dug, and then it was shipped out on the railroad from El Nora in the uh, northern part of town, and it was shipped out on the Old Erie Canal in the southern part of town to various foundries in Albany and Troy, and a lot of those, uh, that sand was used to make cast iron for stoves, uh, parlor stoves were uh, very popular at the time, and, and other things of cast iron. And there are many foundries in Troy and a couple in Albany. This is down at uh, the uh, old settlement of Forts Ferry, uh, where they were digging for sand. Whitehead Brothers it was, a, was a commercial firm uh, that did a lot of mining of molding sand in the area. Uh, and as I say, it's all over the town. So in those days uh, of farms, we had a lot of dirt roads. Uh, this is Route 146, uh, which you can see was a dirt road in 1915, and it's being repaired. This is down in front of the Garnsey uh, homestead. If you know where that is, there's a historic marker in front of it. So it's just before it takes the curve to go into Rexford. <clears throat> Speaking of dirt roads, the picture up above on the left is Route 9. Uh, that picture was taken in 1919, and they're dedicating the monument to the World War I veterans. Uh, anybody remember that monument when it stood there in that place? Yes. And it was right there in the middle of the intersection of Route 9 and 146 in front of the Clifton Park Hotel. And uh, <laughs> the highway department would con consistently complain about having to plow around the monument. So sometime in the 1970s, the monument was moved and it's now at the American Legion Hall on Grooms Road. But uh, I show it because it, uh, 1919 Route 9 was just a two-lane dirt road, and of course 146 was too. 146 went right to the left there. Uh, the new 146 didn't come in yet. And then uh, another picture, 1933, shows that Route 9 had been paved by that time. There's the old Clifton Park Hotel. You can see the monument there in front of it, and it's a, a tourist lodge. In fact, the Clifton Park Hotel, although it's abandoned today, was used right up into the early 70s. Uh, we moved here in 71, and it was still, My still operating. My wedding reception was there. Ha <laughs> ha, this lady's wedding reception was there. <laughs> and I know, I remember there being a country western band that played there for a number of years. <clears throat> People went to one-room schoolhouses in town. And they did this until 1953. Uh, this, is, this is the one-room schoolhouse down in Bisher Ferry. And uh, then in 1950, they decided to centralize. Uh, and they broke ground in 1952. They bought the property that the campus is on today. And they broke ground for the new school in 1950, August of 1952. This is a picture of them actually breaking ground. And there's uh, the, people, the men up in the left are uh, some of the men who were responsible for creating the centralized school district here. 
which includes not just Clifton Park, but parts of Waterford. Of course, it includes Half Moon, uh, Mechanicville, um, and uh, did I say Waterford? Waterford also, uh, parts of that. So, uh, but the, ca the school did not open until 1953. So people were attending one-room schools uh, until 1953 uh, when the new Shenandoah campus opened. So there's many, any, anybody here attend one of the one-room schoolhouse? Boy, you're, you're a long-time resident. 47. <laughs> but when, when? 47. 47. Is that when you were born? No, that's when oh. <laughs> No, that's when we moved there. Um, okay. We used to go to Mechanicville for ninth grade because the school hadn't opened yet. So I went through uh, Clifton Park 12 on Cemetery Road until eighth grade and then um, went to Mechanicville for ninth grade, and then I was in the third graduating class from Shen. Okay. And here's one of these one-room schoolhouses. This was the last year it was used, 1952. And this is the one on the corner of Mo Road and Grooms Road, which is now used as a nursery school. And the teacher in this picture, I have another picture of uh, a class picture at this school, dated 19, it's either 1905 or 1906. And this teacher in that picture is one of the students. So it's kind of neat. People didn't go very far in those days. And you didn't even have to have, in the early 20th century, you didn't even have to have a, a degree to teach. You know? It was just somebody who was uh, fairly knowledgeable in the community who would teach school. I know my, my grandmother and my great-grandmother both taught school out uh, here. And here we have uh, a reunion of the, the very first class to graduate from the new school in 1954. Anybody recognize anybody who knows? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you should be giving the talk. <laughs> I, I can probably almost name every one of them. And of There's course, the one on the lady on the left is Mrs. Simmons, oh, right? Sure Margaret is. Simmons. And the, um, the next one was Betty DeVoe, but the other two were uh, also teachers. Okay. And, uh, yeah, Margaret Simmons was yeah. one of the teachers, and there's a very interesting... Uh, Coach L is right behind her. ...story about her getting the job here at Shindahoe, because she's African-American, and uh, I, her, I interviewed her on tape, and that is here in the uh, history room here at the library. <clears throat> it was a very interesting interview. Well, I'm going to have to get you to write down all of these people's <laughs> names. <laughs> okay, so that's the way things looked here in the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, then there was this gentleman by the name of Robert Van Patten, and uh, he, uh, he was a radio repairman for Sears. And for a while, he operated a mobile gas station in Schenectady from the 1940s into the early 50s. Uh, and he had a salvage business tearing down buildings. And he built the Mayfair Shopping Plaza on Route 50 in Glenville. So that's his background. He had a, a background, and a diverse background, partially in building and, and tearing buildings down. Well, in 1957, he, he built the first uh, subdivision here in Clifton Park, um, which was called Country Club Acres. And this is one of the houses that he built there. And he actually lived there in Country Club Acres for a number of years. Um, you can see it's, we even have a historic marker there for Clifton Park's first subdivision. And it was actually the same year that our town hall was built. Uh, prior to 1957, we didn't have a town hall. We had a town clerk, and they operated out of the town clerk's house, so the town board would meet at the town clerk's house. Uh, for many years, uh, it was at the home of the Peck family. The Peck family had been town clerks for several generations. Millie Peck was the last of the Pecks to be town clerk. And um, during the early years when the Pecks were town clerks, everything operated out of their house, which was across the street from where the uh, Clifton Park Baptist Church used to be. And I emphasize used to be, because that was torn down recently. Uh, and they still have some of the, uh, some of the things that were uh, used by the town clerk. They still have that, some, the desk and all in the house there, which is now on the 
Clifton Park's uh, town register of historic places. Uh, and we actually have the original town clerk's post office, which is displayed at the historic groom's tavern. And that's an interesting story, too, <laughs> because uh, somebody mentioned that to me. I'd become town historian in 1978. But I was very young then. I was, I was the youngest town historian in the state. I think I started when I was 12. And, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but anyway, sometime in the late 70s or early 80s, someone said they had seen this post office at a garage sale in Del Mar. So I, I went and uh, I saw all of these stickers for Clifton Park and, you know, assessor, etc. cetera. And, and there were broadsides, election broadsides, going back to the 1870s. And they were all for people in Clifton Park. So I, I acquired this and uh, it's now at the, at the tavern. But that was probably in the Peck home as well. Then, this happened, and uh, Robert Van Patten knew this was happening. The North Way was constructed, Route 87, and uh, initially it came up to Latham. Uh, that was as far as it went, it was Latham, and then they, they finished the bridge across the Mohawk in 1959. So now you could come to Clifton Park uh, from Albany. And uh, Van Patten started buying up a lot of farmland in the Clifton Knowles area, what later became Clifton Knowles. And it was, there were four farms there that he, he bought up. Uh, one was the farm of Heath Peck. This is where uh, Heath lived. This was the house, the house is still standing. Uh, the original home was built about 1807 by Abijah Peck, who was the founder of the Clifton Park Center Baptist Church. And it descended in the family. So Heath Peck and his wife lived here. And what Van Patten would do when he bought the farmland, he would offer to build them a home in his new development. And, uh, and so he started the Clifton Knowles. The north end of Clifton Knowles was the original Heath Peck farm around Beechwood. That's the first section that was built. And uh, that area going off of Clifton Park Center Road into is, is the first, were the first houses built in Clifton, Clifton Knowles. And of course, they, he built one for the Pecks. And Mrs. Peck was delighted when she moved into her home uh, because for the first time, this is 1961, folks, for the first time, she had indoor plumbing. She didn't have to go out back to the outhouse. She had running water that came right into her kitchen sink. She couldn't believe it. She was overjoyed. So uh, uh, this was one of the first farms that he was able to acquire. These were the other farms uh, that went into the creation of Clifton Knowles. So we talked about Heath Peck. Then there was the rear portion of Walter Gifford's farm. Uh, do you know where uh, Walter Gifford's farm is? The old farmhouse is still there. The Giffords operated a farm there uh, for many years. You could buy berries or whatever there. It's right on Fisher Ferry Road. It's the house behind that big solid fence. Yeah. Yes, my son got his first job there, picking beans. Uh, anyway, that connected with the farm of Heath Peck. Then Greenlee Farm was the farm of Irving Peck. And uh, that bordered the Gifford Farm on the south along Fisher Ferry Road. And that farmhouse still exists. It's right on the corner of Fisher Ferry Road and Green Greenlee Drive. Um, and then the, the last piece of property he acquired and took him a while to acquire this was the su southern part of what is Clifton Knowles. And he purchased that from Vincent Segata. He was known as Jimmy, however. He was a Spaniard, and native-born Spaniard. And, uh, and, and, he, uh, and that bordered the south side of the Heath Peck farm and uh, was entered from the north side of Grooms Road, uh, Barney Road. That was the actual the farm that Sagata owned was the old Barney farmhouse. In fact, this is the Barney farmhouse here. This is where uh, uh, Jimmy Sagata lived. And uh, in the winter, he only lived like in one room. He treated this house as a barn and he stacked, stacked hay in most of the other rooms uh, for the winter. 
And, well, Jimmy wasn't interested in having a house, you know, then Patton would offer, he bought land from a house. Well, Jimmy wasn't interested in that. So finally, uh, then Patton offered him a room in the clubhouse. There was a clubhouse. And so Jimmy went for that, and he finally sold, uh, sold his property. And also, Van Patten let him name some of the roads in that part of the development. And guess what? They all have these Spanish names. So you have Par del Rio, Casablanca, uh, what are the other well, ones? El Dorado. Yeah. So that's how those got the name. He, he let Sagata name them. Uh, I remember we moved here to Clifton Park in 1971. And I remember getting behind this big Cadillac, and the license plate was Sagata. <laughs> and he drove 20 miles an hour. <laughs> so anyway, so this is the plan of uh, Clifton Knowles, which Van Patten laid out. And uh, So let me see if I can figure this out, because it's not what you'd expect. This is Moe Road here. So this is Grooms Road. Grooms Road, Moe Road. Clifton Park Center Road and Fisher Ferry Road. So this is what it looks like. Now, Jimmy Segato, uh, when he lived there, he created ponds. He uh, uh, dammed up the Stony Creek and, and created these ponds. And then he would advertise. People from the city would come out and fish in his ponds. He would stop them. And so those ponds became part of Clifton Knowles. Uh, that's where those ponds came from. And you can see them in the drawing here. These are the ponds. This was the clubhouse. There's a pond here, pond here. And the other thing he built was a golf course. This was something that was happening nationally. People were moving out of the cities to the suburbs. Now, people didn't want to live in the city anymore. They wanted to live in, in the open spaces. And uh, one thing that started this movement out of the cities were shopping centers. You know, before you went downtown to do your shopping. As a, I remember as a kid living in Albany, it was a big deal to go downtown to North Pearl Street and visit Myers and Whitney's at department stores. But now the shopping centers, Westgate was one of the shopping centers in our area. Uh, and that opened and shortly after Stuyvesant Plaza opened and then Latham. Those were the three early shopping centers in our area. I used to love to go to the Boston store in Latham because they had an escalator. I'd never been on an escalator before, and we used to just go there to ride the escalator. Uh, so, you know, and then, so, so people moved out of the cities, and they could shop out of the cities as well. They had these shopping centers to go to. And uh, these subdivisions were created to attract people to the country. So. Uh, uh, Van Patten did a nice job because he had these lakes, he had the golf course, he had the clubhouse, so there were swimming pools. Uh, uh, it was a very rural type of lifestyle. So this is uh, some of the advertising material uh, that he used, showing the various uh, types of buildings that he sold. We'll talk a little bit about that later, but it features the swimming pool and uh, Nicely, nicely treed lots, and he was known for that. He didn't just level the property. He left some of the mature trees. And he was an interesting guy because you would do business with him with a handshake. There were no written documents when you bought a house. It was strictly on a handshake. And by the time he got done, if he didn't like you, he wouldn't sell you the house. If you gave him a hard time, he'd say, forget it. Okay, so uh, this is uh, really interesting. This is the uh, one, uh, detail of one of the advertising brochures. So it says, let's see if I can read this. Your location is a picturesque setting uh, within minutes of new schools, shopping centers, and churches with all its natural beauty and suburban spaciousness. Clifton Knowles is surprisingly close, only 20 minutes to downtown Schenectady or Saratoga Springs, 30 minutes to downtown Albany, 25 minutes to Troy, and 10 minutes to the Latham Shopping Center. Your house stands at the gateway to the 
finest recreational areas of New York State, the Saratoga Spa, Lake George, and the Adirondacks. So this was the big attraction. Your enjoyment is doubly uh, rewarded uh, for you and your children in one of the finest private recreational facilities in the East. You are eligible for membership at the Clifton Knowles Club. Uh, for you, a beautiful outdoor pool, pitch and putt course, dancing, and other gala social events. For your children, a superb playground, picnic area, camping facilities, a wading pool for the tiny tots, and swimming instructions, and Red Cross certified lifeguards to supervise the younger set. So these are all reasons why people would move uh, to the suburbs. And here again, we have a sort of an aerial view of the Clifton Knowles as it was being developed. And there's that wonderful pool at the clubhouse. So which style house do you live in? <laughs> so here, here, here are some of the styles. So we have the executive ranch. These are ranch uh, house styles. And they were framed by a man by the name of Dan Ward. The styles of houses were named after the contractors who framed them. So this would be the, the Don Ward rather than they wouldn't call it the executive. Later on, they called it the executive branch. But in the early days, it was the Don Ward. And so this was the raised ranch. Oh, the prices, by the way, yes, at this time raised ranged from the low to upper 20,000s. So I remember even when we bought our house in Clifton Park down in Bishop Ferry uh, and, and the homes by uh, Rosen and Michaels were selling for about the same price. It was like $32,000. $32, and my total tax bill, uh, both property and school taxes, was a grand sum of $275, which was another reason people moved here to Clifton Park. The taxes were really low. And the land that Van Patten bought, he bought it really cheap, so he could offer these large houses at a, a very affordable price. <clears throat> Here's the colonial. One style colonial was framed by uh, Hank Graves and was referred to as the Hanks. And then the other was framed by Stan Merrick and was referred to as the Stans. <laughs> Later on, they got a little more sophisticated and they, they, they changed them. So, and, and Country Knolls was built, uh, they, start, they started that in 1964, Country Knolls further north, and you had a huge swimming pool there as well. Um, here's the, the Clifton Knolls golf course, which the town now owns. And uh, it had a restaurant in the clubhouse where you could go and get lunch or dinner. And these are some of the early menus from it. It must have had a Spanish motif. Anybody remember? Anybody been in the clubhouse? I, excuse me? Big wedding receptions during the 80s. Oh, yeah? yeah. Wedding receptions during the 80s. So uh, anyway, take a look at some of these prices. <laughs> I saw a lobster roll on here for $2.75. Yeah, and lobster salad for two seventy-five. <clears throat> of course, people. I remember my first job, which uh, was in 1967, not too far from when this menu was created, and it was a, a, a wonderful salary. It was more than school teachers made. I made seventy-five hundred dollars a year. And that was a real good salary in '67. So Van Patten went on uh, to build more homes. There were 800 houses in Clifton Knowles. Country Knowles, which he began in 64, 1,270 homes. Country Knowles South in 1973, 600 homes. Uh, and then Northway 11 Apartments, 
We had a thousand apartments, so he did quite a job in uh, populating Clifton Park uh, in the 1960s and 70s. I remember he also had his own hardware store, uh, which was up in El Nora. I don't know if any of you remember that. Uh, was there for a while. I think it burned in the in the late 70s. So you know, anything that he used to build his houses, if you needed to repair something, you could go to the hardware store there and, and buy it. And he, from what I've heard from people who bought houses from him and knew him, uh, I guess he was really uh, great, you know, in, in fixing things that were wrong with the house. I know it's, uh, I talked to some people who had some problems with the foundation, and he said, don't let anybody touch it. I'll be there and fix it. And he came back and, and fixed it. So, you know, if you bought a Van Patten house, he stood behind his product. But as I say, if on the other hand you complained too much and he didn't like it by the time you finished the house, he wouldn't sell you the house. <clears throat> so uh, Van Patten died in 1990. This is his monument in the Jonesville Cemetery. And uh, uh, I thought it was presumptuous. Somebody put down there right under his name, it says Father of Clifton Park maybe father of modern Clifton Park, I suppose. He did bring a lot of people to the area. And notice the maple tree on the stone, because he was known for leaving uh, trees around uh, the development. And right across the road from him is Vincent Segata, uh, his old pal who he bought the southern part of the Knowles from, who died a year after Van Patten died. So this is the way Clifton Park looked in 1965, okay? This is Clifton Knowles right here. That's it. <laughs> Otherwise, you had Rexford. You have Fisher Ferry down here. Groom's Corners. Clifton Park Center. You're right in here someplace. And Clifton Park Village, Jonesville. There, there wasn't much, much here in 65 except for Clifton Knowles. That's what started it. What were the red uh, blotches in the center of the squares? What are those indicating? I don't know. I'm not sure. Oops, sorry. Uh, I not no. I was thinking historic areas, but no. I don't. I don't know what those indicate. So Van Patten started something. Uh, Rose and Michaels came in in the southern part of our town. Uh, they constructed uh, Crescent Estates Apartments in 1967, and at the same time, they bought up the old Rio farm. It was a, a, an apple orchard in southern Clifton Park, and they started uh, uh, Crescent Estates. And uh, uh, those were being built in the early 70s, being sold, as I mentioned. And at that time, the raised ranch was a popular new architectural design. So there's a lot of raised ranches uh, in uh, Crescent Estates where you uh, enter in the middle of the house and you have to either go upstairs to the living area or downstairs to the family room. And of course, the garages were a part of the house as well. Hollandale Apartments were one of the early developments here in town. And of course, down in the southern part, of the town was Foxwood Apartments. And uh, you know, the housing boom began. And again, it's all because of the Northway and the automobile, because people could now live a distance from where they worked. The first shopping center in town was on the corner of 146 and Fisher Ferry Road. That would be the southeast corner. And that opened in 1968. And Park Pharmacy was there, and there was a grocery store there. I think originally it was the Grand Union uh, before, before uh, Price Chopper took it over. And uh, so that was our, our first shopping center. That was sort of like the center of town. And then across the road, shortly after that was constructed, whoops, shortly after that was constructed, uh, they built uh, other stores across the way, including, I, I remember there being a Barker's and, and Change to Joy's, 
a department store. And uh, then they had a movie theater. It was like a, I remember going there and seeing Star Wars for a dollar with the kids. And uh, then there was a skating rink. There was another grocery store, and that uh, they left that uh, uh, and moved over to the uh, uh, shopping center, and that became Starburst Roller Skating Rink. Uh, so that that began the commercial development of Clifton Park in that area. And it was interesting because that's where the commercial center was going to be. So then, uh, and, and then around the same time as that's opening, I mean, you can see with the increased population, suburbia starting to take shape, we needed some of these amenities uh, that people wanted, like a library. And so the library was formed in 1969. And the building where it was uh, first housed is uh, uh, a brick building. It was, I think, is it the Key Bank, Key Bank. still? Yeah. It was a bank building back then also, and they, they yeah. inhabited the, uh, the top floor, the second floor of that building. That was only for a year. Then they moved into this building, which had been a Baptist church. It's on the corner of Cemetery Road and Old Route 146. It had been a Baptist church, and then it was used as a school. Yeah, and in fact, people went to school here in 1953. Is that where you went to school? Okay. So, uh, and I remember going to the library here. It was really folksy. I mean, <laughs> compared to this place, it, you know, <laughs> you, you couldn't say a word without it being heard all over the library. And uh, everything was wood and, you know, it was just really folksy. <laughs> We've come a long way, baby. So then, in 1973, Walt Engelmore and their family sell their farm for a new enclosed shopping center. Uh, now, originally, this, these, these people who bought that farm were trying to buy property on the northwest corner of Route 146 and Fisher Ferry Road. But they ran into problems. They couldn't buy that property, and I guess partly because it had been a gas station and it needed some remediation, and maybe that's why they didn't buy it, or whether it's zoning wasn't proper, I'm not sure, but they gave up on trying to acquire that piece of property and then went over here by the north way, by exit nine, and bought the farm of Walt Engelmore and a couple other uh, uh, pieces of farmland as well. And this became Clifton Country Mall. And they opened their doors in 1975. And this was really exciting. For once, we had a real shopping mall where you could buy clothes, groceries. They had everything here. There was a grocery store. Um, I'm trying to remember. Was it Caldors? It was a Caldors uh, department store. <coughs> Penny's was there. Penny's was one of the anchors, and that's still there. And uh, so I remember when we moved here in 1971, there, there was absolutely nothing. There was no banks to get a mortgage at. We had to go to Latham to get our mortgage. And uh, the other thing I remember, uh, every day I'd go on the roads, is that there were absolutely no traffic lights in Clifton Park except for the one at Route 9 and 146. No traffic lights at all. You could get around a lot faster. Of course, there were no cars either. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, so, so the mall opened, and this, this was a really a big deal. <clears throat> These are uh, views of the mall uh, shortly after, after it opened. And it was an inside mall, which made a lot of sense in the summer, or not in the summer, in the winter. And so you could you know, move around. A lot of people went there to, to get exercise, walk. And I could never understand why they broke that apart and then started putting, you know, making stores outside the indoor area. And it was crazy. To me, it was crazy. But they did it. I guess, I guess people are too lazy to, to walk, so they want to be able to park their cars right in front of the store. I, I, I couldn't for the life of me figure out why they, why they did that, but they did it. And now it's called Clifton Park Center, which really annoyed the heck out of me because we have a hamlet named Clifton Park Center. And it's very confusing if you want to talk about Clifton Park Center. 
Clifton Park Center is where the town hall is. It's where the Clifton Park Center Baptist Church was. Clifton Park Center Road led to it. Now it leads to the shopping center as well. <laughs> so it, it bridges the gap between two Clifton Park centers. Also, uh, if any of you have lived here for any length of time, the post office for Clifton Park was El Nora. Most of the people that lived in Clifton Park had an El Nora post office address. And this is the El Nora post office right here. And you had a, a, an El Nora post office address until 1976 when the Clifton Park post office opened on Route 9. So uh, the El Nora post office had been in business for 86 years. And uh, the, the population of, the, of town grew from about 4,000 in the uh, in, uh, late 50s, early 60s, uh, to 37,000. I think today it's even up to 40-some thousand. Yeah, they keep building houses, people keep coming. Traffic keeps increasing. So this is the, sort of the way Clifton Park looked in 2000. So you can see between you know, 1960 and 2000, all of these developments have come in. And since 2000, there's even more. And you can see where the western part of town was still fairly open, but this is now filling in. I mean, we have these uh, developments along Route 146 now, all in here. And if you've noticed, they're, they're building in back of uh, Ravenswood there. They're having apartments there. You go up 146A and over on the left, they're clearing land to build some more. Uh, so we're going to get lots, lots more neighbors yet. And the school it continues to grow as well. Uh, they now have two high schools. Whoops. So anyway, th and so that's how Clifton Park started its uh, suburban uh, uh, sprawl, which still continues. And uh, uh, we now have parks in Clifton Park. The first park that Clifton Park put in was Collins Park, and that was in 19, uh, 1972, I believe. And then, of course, we've, they acquired the common. We have lots of other open space property. Recently, we've acquired the 34 acres. It ties in with the, the, the library and school here. Uh, so, you know, a lot has happened in Clifton Park. Uh, since 1960. So I'll be glad to uh, answer any questions you might have. Interesting, only a couple people here live in the Knowles. Any, any memories of that? Yes? We were trying to figure out where, what is the northern boundary of Clifton Park? We're in, we're in the Knowles, and the, so part of us is Clifton Park, part of us is Malta. And we're trying to figure out where on if Route you, 9. Which knolls do you live in? Country, country knolls. Country knolls. And where on Route 9 does country knolls end in Malta? Okay, because the town line uh, goes over Route 9 in some places. Uh, for example, uh, the hamlet of Ushers is actually in Clifton Park, which uh, uh, Corpus Christi Church mm -hmm. is in Clifton Park. Okay. Um, but the boundaries don't go much further than that. It goes a little beyond there to the railroad tracks, I think. Um, but for the most part, you know, you can almost consider Route 9 as the boundary. So you, I don't know that you go into Malta. Yeah, that's what we were wondering, you know, how far up, how far north on 9 before you hit Malta. I mean, if you go up East, Li East Line Road, you yeah. can see where the town begins and I think you're so you get up there and there's those apartments that Van Patten built what are those apartments names what are they yes that's it yeah and and those are those are in Malta Round Lake actually yeah yeah so you know but you can see that there's a sign there and, and I think that I don't know that much of uh, of uh, Country Knowles goes out of Clifton Park. There is, there's, once you get above Shadowwood, okay. you just start hitting Malta. 
Okay, so there may be a, a section that goes yeah. a little further. Yeah, we just couldn't figure out where on Route 9 it was hitting, where the, the differences were up there. Because yeah. it seems like it's not a, it's not a, a direct, uh, as you say, it's, it's not all just straight up, because as, as you said, even over into Ushers. So this is Country Knowles here, I assume. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, and, and soon as you get up a little bit past Shadowwood, okay. then you're running into Malta. It looks like there's a big open space here. Because this, so this is the Clifton Park town line right here. But if you looked at a map, you should be able to figure okay. figure that out. Yes. Do you know what they're doing at the intersection of 146 and there's a Fisher's Ferry where we were just talking about where they didn't build the mall Mark Sotomato used to yes. be right across there. They took out all those trees. It's going to be a roundabout. Oh shoot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Well, I'd rather have that than a building. I don't know why. I thought they were going to try to drop a building in there. Yeah, we lost our Christmas tree. Yeah. 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 It's going to be around and around. Okay. Yes. Um, I have a question. I'm wondering where, where the school is. Is that part of the Peck Farm? Where part? what? Where the school is built. Was that part of the Peck Farm? No, not that I know of. I don't know. I yeah. Off top of my head, I don't know who owned that land. I have it someplace, but uh, it's quite a bit of acreage that they bought. It was, yeah, and it's, it was probably farmland, though, don't you think? Yeah, but very sandy, so not very good farmland. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes? We were on the 68, near exit 8, Clifton Park. We had three post offices. Rex Street was not <laughs> post office at first. So my mom just kept putting it in pencil and erasing <laughs> post office all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It goes Rexford, then Elnor, and then Clifton Yeah, because we live in Bisher Ferry, and our post office is Rexford. Okay. Uh, other people who live in Clifton Park uh, are Boston, Boston Lake okay. post office. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, of course, you have people in Half Moon who have a Clifton Park address. The point was, we had three different three post offices and never moved. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's changed around. <laughs> That's the easy way to move. <laughs> I told the new laws we kept on moving up. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Does anybody remember Cuckoo's Pizza that was over by Grand Union? What is it? Cuckoo's Pizza. Cuckoo's Pizza. Anybody remember no. Cuckoo's Pizza? There used to be a big gully there that was built in on one on Vicious Ferry. If you're going north on Bishop Ferry Road, just before you get the price chopper now, that used to go go quite a ways down to the stream and come back up and then there was Cooper's okay. Pizza up on the right, Grand Union, Grand Union like I said. That was and before the, before the big box stores came, you know, uh, there were all these mom and pop stores around. So you, you, could, you, know, you had the Bishop Ferry General Store, which actually, you know, you could buy groceries there. Uh, I remember Hatchies, Rosen's, uh, all these little stores around. I remember uh, um, hardware stores too. The Pecks operated a hardware store, and, and the same with George Smith there at uh, in El Nora. You know they had the hardware stuff. But then as soon as Lowe's and, and Home Depot came in, it ran them all out of business. And the same thing with the major grocery stores and mom and pop stores couldn't couldn't survive, so they, they all went out of business. So now there's a Stewart's on every corner. <laughs> yes? Now with the, um, yeah, we've only been in the park five years, but you're talking about all the farms, and then I noticed the soil was so sick and deep. What did they grow? What was good for growing in the sand? Uh, I know there was a lot of truck farms in the 1940s, so they, they grew things that they would take to market. So they evidently made it work. They made it work. Someone told me there was strawberries around. And of course there were dairy cows also. Yes, yeah, strawberries are good. Are they in sand? You can grow it out I mean, Giffords had a lot of that kind of stuff. They grew raspberries, strawberries. <coughs> yes, and a lot of apple orchards, and we still have some apple orchards. Yeah. Yeah. We live at Lamp Road, and actually they, mm -hmm. and we 
we moved in in 67, there was an abandoned farm on the other side of Lap Road that's filled with asparagus. We used to go over there the first 10 years and get our asparagus over here. <laughs> in the same asparagus. <laughs> in the same yeah. Yeah. They're all, they're all dunes from Old Lake. Yes, yeah, we had an asparagus patch in the house that we uh, acquired also, but I mowed it down. <laughs> <laughs> Too hard to mow around it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What was in the area where we're now looking to do a town park here for 37 acres? Is that farmland along 146? I don't know what was in that area. I get a lot of calls from uh, builders who are do, have to do an, an environmental uh, impact statement. They all want to know, you know, what, what's the history of that piece of land? And uh, in some cases, there just was nothing there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there were farms throughout Clifton Park, but there was also vacant land. Yes. I'm just wondering, more and more we hear about uh, Clifton Park wanting to make it a more walkable community. <laughs> Do you think that's anywhere near possible at the way that they've grown to haphazardly? Well, I think. yes. Uh, we have a trails committee. We have a wonderful system of trails. Wait, 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 wait. I say walking so that you can get to do things, not just walk on a trail. Okay. I actually do a ride around Clifton Park Mall mm -hmm. to show people that they can ride their bikes to the mall or walk to the mall. There From are where? pathways there that you can use. Uh, well, we usually, well, it, in, it's a larger area that we include, but we usually start, where do we start with that ride? We start at the uh, senior center, uh, okay. okay? And then we, we come, I forgot where we go now. We, we cut through the school. To the school, yes, uh, to Mo Road, Collins Park, and then there's a sidewalk there that you can take, and then we go where the uh, the police are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can cut through there and into the mall area, and uh, there's uh, sidewalks there. Uh, we ride on and you know talk about this to the mall, and then we go on out to. Uh, oh, we take the the. Uh, there's a path that comes from the school to the library. In fact, the library is one of our refreshment stops. We have refreshments yeah. in the parking lot. And, and then we head on down Mo Road via the bike trail uh, to, uh, uh, to Englemore Road and then come up Fisher Ferry Road back to the... Oh, then we take the... There's a wonderful trail also uh, that goes... Uh, I call it the Clifton Park Center Trail because it goes in back of the oaks and all of those developments. It's a wonderful off-road trail. If you like to walk, you could go there. Uh, and we bike that and come back out onto Clifton Park Center Road. Yeah, and, and there's also one uh, Settlers, there's a development called Settlers something. Settlers it's, Hill. What is it? Settlers Hill. Yeah, Settlers Hill. Settlers Hill. And there's an off-trail there. And a lot of people walk there at lunchtime. I see people from town hall walking there. So, yeah. But you're right. I mean, there's so much traffic around the mall. It's a, it's a difficult place. And trying to cross 146 is impossible. You take your life in your hands. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. So that dream will never come true. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. Oh. I work for the town. I can't say that. <laughs> 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 They're working on it. They're working on it, okay. <laughs> and now they've got residences there, too. I mean, they're, they're building, I don't know whether they're apartments or condominiums right there on uh, Clifton Country Mall Road. And, and, and what's that other place called uh, near the Y? Um, the Bentley. Bentley. Bentley, yeah. So they've got people living there, too, which need to be able to walk. I mean, that's a whole, whole reason to live there was so that you could, you know, walk to places like that. Other questions, comments? Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you.